well, we are doing a residency. We are doing a uh, we are doing hands-on work here. So as you can see, we are in this environment, and uh, there are no bad failures. There are uh, all mistakes are valuable, yeah. as we often yeah. often say. So Indeed. and yeah, we don't find it shameful to make mistakes. <laughs> we we um. Yeah, we're, we're working on a, on a balloon-based project here, um, and I guess we we just started to get set up here as part of the residency. We didn't really want to move everything off the stage, so we talked to Golem. Golem was very accommodating, saying that just stay on the stage. So we, we just sort of got presenting from our place of work. Um, whether that is, is meaningful at all, I'm not sure, but, uh, well, but it's convenient it's, for us it's at least. Kind of natural or not natural. Indeed. Sort of yeah. In the flow. We don't break the flow. Sure. At least not ours. <laughs> you want to speak as I you want to speak louder? Yeah. Okay. Uh, should, we, should, should we start? Um, yep. Uh, talk, about, talk about the balloon a bit or not? Yeah. Oh, sure. Okay. okay. Yeah. Well, just a little intro. There is a balloon in the middle of the table, but it's, uh, we are not going to show you uh, that thing yet. We can show you this, though, because, <coughs> well. <laughs> looks like a skinned. Yeah, it looks like a gut skin. Uh, goat's yeah. gut. <laughs> Something like this. There is this thing which you, some of you might recognize, but in fact it's going to be used upside down, and there's going to be lots of electronics hidden in it and shot yeah. into the stratosphere. Yeah. We're working on this right now. We've got a, we've got a weather balloon that that will go up to um, 30 kilometers in height, which is about 11, 1,000, oh, sorry, 110,000 feet in height, and then it will pop. But it'll be carrying a nice big payload of a um, of a wide spectrum antenna that will get pretty much everything available to the um, in the marine and say submarine communications, um, military, air to air, air, air to, to air. earth, air to satellite, air and satellite. earth to satellite, yeah. comlinks, and so we, we're really interested in, in reading in reading that space between the ground and the and the stratosphere because it's it's actually a space that we don't have access to and increasingly being filled up with um, unidentified autonomous vehicles and so yeah, we're particularly right. interested in that. We're working with or, two. Yeah. Robots are not necessarily necessarily going to travel on the surface of Earth. They will travel around the Very Earth, and they will not look like robots. They will look like strange Swiss. machines, strange airborne machines, and Indeed. sort of trying to map those out. Yeah, and uh, I've been working with a couple of researchers that have kindly donated their time here in the uh, in, in the studio, and uh, and they're doing some yeah. of that research for us, both in antenna design and in the. Um, in the meanwhile, we are struggling in storm and trying to get from place to place to pick up antennas. Sounds to be the worst time to be launching a balloon. We were yeah. running around today in the car, it was a bit of a journey yeah. in, the, in the snow. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, um, you can stop in a bit later in the in the week and see our progress. Hopefully we'll have some um, some imagery. We, we might even do a little test launch tomorrow of the of a balloon just up maybe um, 1,500 yeah. 1, feet or something like that, mm -hmm. tethered balloon. We've got a fishing rod, big game fishing rod, and a, mm -hmm. and a mountain which is going to mount it to the back of a, of a pickup and then just wind this thing up right. and uh, see how much of a payload we can carry. Yeah. yeah. Unless the snowfall is so hard that the balloon won't run. Yeah, exactly. It, well, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. So anyway, the, the talk for tonight will we'll take this name, Critical Exploits. It's one that we've given um, a few a few times around the place. We just um, we gave a, a, a lesser version of it in um, in Ohio as part of our network shop series uh, there, and uh, we've got about uh, 55 minutes to an hour, so we're just going to push through it and show you a whole bunch of projects that don't necessarily relate specifically to the work that we are doing here um, specifically, but um, but yeah, that more relate to. This, this idea of critical engineering in the context of the exploit, or the art of the exploit. Yeah, yeah. So um, we'll start with this uh, quote, which is a very important quote by um, an excellent uh, man by the name of Bruno Latour, famous for his actor network theory and, and many other things, but he was quite um, concerned with this, uh, this concept of a black box, of, of opacity in the, in, the, in the context of technology, and this is an important one for us. Um, when a machine runs efficiently, when a matter of fact is settled, one need focus only on its inputs and outputs and not on its internal complexity. Thus, paradoxically, the more that science and technology get better at what they're doing, the more they succeed, the more opaque and obscure uh, they become. Mm. Yeah. Well, probably many of you have experienced that uh, barrier, the barrier as in language barrier, for instance, for me, sometimes I experience that same thing applies to technology, same thing applies to programming, same thing applies to hardware design that it has gone all so far that mm. you, you find no entry point. You, you don't know where to start from because it's so complex and so mm. 
so um, unapproachable that many people just lose faith in having, having to start to understand where where it began and like what it is. Mm. You know, it's, by that it became so opaque in some mm. way. And mythic even, reside, mm. residing in the mythic, you know, mm. almost in the imaginary. Um, and and he, here is a, is a very, very simple, um, rather pixelated um, example of the of, 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 a, of a black box from, read from a techno-political perspective, you might say, where one has input and one has output, um, but then there's this feedback control loop, and, and whoever is the, 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 the if, you, if you might say, the, the manufacturer or creator of that particular black box has in their command that feedback control loop, and that's where the, the exploit, or at least the reduction of power, as a, as a user and operator. And so this is a question of invisibility and opacity. Um, yeah, um, and which becomes more of a problem when we start talking about this thing called infrastructure. Indeed. Like that, you could say a few words about that. What is that? Yeah, that's... Do you recognize this? Anyone? Yeah? That's uh, actually quite old model of the internet, rendering of the internet, uh, mathematically uh, bold, obviously. Uh, you can see how complex it is, speaking of infrastructure, that's, that's what our lives are sort of driven by these days. That's the mess that controls uh, most of the things we do, most of the things we hear, most of the things we see, T TV, uh, voice over IP, uh, think the Internet of Things, you know, that's, that's the infrastructure. And how complex is that? And what would take one to understand and to get in control at least of a portion of this uh, extended network of networks? It's engineered infrastructure is a, is a part of our environment and so it follows that unless one can at least even conceptually describe the constituent engineered elements of our increasingly engineered environment, um, we cannot say we can critically engage the world that we live in um, and that does have political, cultural, social, um, secondary effects, tertiary mm. effects. On a small scale, we can look at this object here um, as an example of, of, or at least as an anchor point for, for, for this conversation, we can think of this as being very much a, uh, an extroverted uh, work of technology. This was the shit-hot MP3 player of its day. Um, and here we have this, this horn shape at the top, which by its very, um, by its very shape amplifies. You know, one even sees amplification described by its, by its, by its very form. And, and we have on the, on the, on the right-hand side, on, yeah, you're right, down here we have this energy input in the form of a crank, um, the platter, we have the records, the spiral, and if we look closely the needle goes in. So you, just, just by looking at it and then, and then hearing where the sound comes out and the amplification effect at work, one can safely say that this is a, is a, is a, is a very social work of technology. All of its outward, um, all of its, its, its inner functionality, if you like, are expressed outwardly, which is quite the opposite of of this being just a field of surfaces and largely metaphors. There's several layers of abstraction between us and the, the, the inner working of that object. It's, it's modern day equivalent. I mean, And it's not only the, the high degree of integration, uh, it is as well, of course, to a larger extent, degree of uh, copyright and uh, proprietary ownership of these mm. devices. Because that gramophone was developed at the time when copyright was just about to kick in and no one could even think of uh, black boxing their technology in order to preserve its uh, 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 its genuine sort of idea, hide it. You know, there was even no uh, no purpose for hiding as such, for mm -hmm. black boxing as such. Indeed, this is a very good point. Almost none of us um, would 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 know anyone that could wholly describe or each one of the 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 the. the these parts, what they do, I mean, even where the energy input is, you might say, where the, where the battery, the interface of the what? battery is. Yeah. I mean, and, and between us and doing that, there is a there is a small wall of lawyers, or I like to think of the collective noun of lawyers as being maybe a murder of lawyers. But um, <laughs> but you know, sort of like crows, you know, sort of circling around the I, the iPod Nano. But um, but you know, just just to actually open it up itself, you're already compromising your own ownership, your your ability to get the the, the thing repaired. Um, and that's, that comes in the form of what we call a warranty. Um, and, uh, and that says a lot about our right to read and our right to, to modify, even ownership itself. Is it really ownership, really? I mean, is, is it any different from the rental car that we have here at the moment? You know? Is it not a lease, you know, of sorts? 
the corporation is still attached to this device by at least one of its tentacles. You know, mm. there is still either an IP a network connection to it or liability mm. uh, agreement or end user license that mm. attaches the company that produced that to the very user that supposedly owns it. Mm. And, we, and we wouldn't accept that with a, with a bicycle, for instance. Um, you know, we, we wouldn't buy a bike knowing that that uh, that that. The, you know, we'd breach our warranty if we were to repair the, or if you the, break it, the, 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 the tire or something like this. Right. You know, if yeah. we were to put a bit of tape on it or customize, you know, it. customize it in any way. But we've we've come to accept that within our relationship to um, to to so-called high technology because it is so complex that we don't even have this idea mm -hmm. of opening it up and looking into it because we're scared. Indeed, we're exactly. scared of doing that. Yeah. Economies of complexity and scale, one, one could say. This, for instance, um, the iPhone iPhone 5s. This is the radio part. There, it, it took some people quite quite some quite some days yeah. to actually find that. How can you tell? Yeah. How can you read it? Yeah, yeah. using special devices actually. Mm -hmm. We don't have enough sensory apparatuses to perceive technology as we perceive our world. Right? Mm -hmm. We simply lack antennas. We lack uh, uh, electric meters. We lack. Uh, many other tools that we have in our drawers instead of having, having them on us. You know? yeah. and we need all, all of that gear to be able to interface ourselves to that. I would love a voltmeter on this finger and say an oscilloscope. Well, effectively it has that would be both but, but it's not it's as important. good. Yeah. Yeah. It just doesn't have an LED output, does it? Yeah. Um, so yeah, the right to deconstruct and modify uh, and ruin are rights that come with ownership. It's like we ex expect that of a bicycle, the right to ruin. The right to modify, we, 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 we ought to consider that right um, transferred to so called high tech gadgets. That speaks for itself. In serif, which gives it more authority, of course. But yeah, the big problem engineering is complex. Its terms themselves are very abstract, so providing a, an, an interface to even opening up these objects for a right to read requires um, a, a significant, I mean, there's quite an entry barrier there. Um, and that, that is an abstraction itself, uh, that's the language and the, um, in the, in the, in the process-based understanding of, of, of how these things work. Sure. Yeah, before you, before you went through layers of hell, now you go through layers of abstractions to get to the yeah. core. Dante's Nano. <laughs> um, <laughs> Dante's Nano Inferno. That's good. <laughs> Intel. Yeah. yeah. That's where Dell is. Dell, Dell, Dell. Yeah. So, um, yeah, what is a computer network? Um, you know, who, who can who can really answer that that, that, that question? What is the internet? Um, you know, almost anyone that you or I um, know would struggle with with um, with being able to answer that question without some degree of some some degree of abstraction. I mean, and, and it would be quite dreary to hear the the, the, the fully approved version. But uh, you can ask almost anyone you know how the postcard you sent them arrived in their mailbox. Um, and they'll be able to give you a relatively coherent description of the postal system and the postcodes and the fact that we have this concept of addresses and we have, um, we have names ascribed to those addresses, et cetera, et cetera, and numbers um, representing street uh, or houses on streets. But, um, but if you would ask that same person how the email you sent them arrived in the inbox, they would be generally struggling to to, to describe without quite a bit of high surrealism, some hopefully good poetry, um, and that's not because they are at all stupid. It's because they, I mean, they were taught in schools more about the solar system and the perhaps the pollination of a flower than they were the the working, the functioning of something that they depend upon um, or would claim to depend upon. Something like email. It's almost cultural infrastructure now. Mm. Yeah, how fragile once reality becomes when one doesn't know such simple things as. We ought to know, for instance, about our physical reality. Mm -hmm. You know, you step out onto the street, and you know about gravitation. You know about inertia. You know, you can distinguish different lights. You know, you don't cross. You don't cross the road in red because you see red. Mm. That's like you're taught not to do it. You know, but in networking context, we are rarely taught anything, and we hardly know uh, a thing about what actually comprises a network and what makes things go. As Julian was saying. How does email, how does it happen that it leaves your computer 
travels across the network, across the world, and in less than a second reaches another person's inbox and pops in, in the corner of the screen, pops mm -hmm. up uh, with a result flag. You know, how does it happen? Yeah. Instead, we met with a few of the surfaces themselves, kind of an abstraction, a little bit like the surface of, say, an iPod Nano. Um, uh, this is, if you like, the application layer, the skin. Um, um, through which we read and understand and, 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 and operate more and more. Quite a hard one. And quite a hard one. And this is also a corporate scheme of sorts. Yeah. Mm. I mean, despite the fact that there are open specifications at least um, uh, grounding and informing the development of, of protocols and deployment of, of, um, of packet switching networks and the like, the, 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 the corporatized skin has, has, has come to replace the, the interface, and this is a proprietary space. Some of you can, can tell that out of all these icons, only two are open open standards. Nevertheless, uh, nevertheless, many like look at look at an iPhone, look at a look at an iPad. Mm. That's that's the UI, that's the interface. It's more like a desire mm. oriented rather than it's more consumer. It's fully consumer oriented rather than producer oriented, yeah, like yeah. all of these icons, they let you suck in much more than actually create something original. Of course, you can upload some of the stuff, but mainly, mainly people click on them to, to suck stuff down, you know, and that became, that mm. became the nature of this uh, technology that we are so uh, powerless that we rather consume than produce. Yeah, this is this is represented in the asymmetry of our domestic mm. uh, network connections. You know, well. The fact that it's more more privileged toward download than it is upload, which says a little bit about writing and reading. Mm -hmm. and yeah. sort of Indeed, hard locked stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, and the most patr patronising of all metaphors that crop up in recent years is, is the cloud, something that we've been rating against um, for for quite some years now, um, six six or so years, pretty much talking about talking about this stuff. Um, this children's book metaphor, largely, um, these, these, this, this deterritorialized image, you know, of clouds that belong to no nation. You know, you, you, you will just push some data up into the cloud in the airport, and then just pull it down at the other side elsewhere. And this is um, this this almost skins over the um, and, and hides, conceals in many ways what is really at work. Um, the, 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 the geophysical reality of geographical reality of, of cloud-based uh, structure. A very clouded concept indeed. indeed. One could say. Um, and so it follows that we had to come up with our own uh, definition of the internet based on our, our conversations with people in workshops and talks all over, all over the world. It's that the internet is a deeply misunderstood technology upon which we increasingly depend. And the techno-political challenges there are very interesting to us and frame much of our work um, in recent years. And this is um, the the um, the OSI stack that's commonly taught in uh, network engineering um, courses, and we're going to frame the rest of this talk really around the stack and moving up the stack from the physical layer to the application layer. This this that layer of the skinned layer of icons mm -hmm. you saw before. Yeah, it's maybe good to imagine this this wedge being whacked into the surface of the earth where physical layer represents mm. the cables, the yeah. copper, the fiber optics yeah. sort of going under the, under the ground or under the seas. Mm. Uh, then all of layers above represent layers of technology that's been sort of smudged mm. over, that, yeah. over that physical network, such as protocols, applications, and so yeah. on and so forth. I'd like to see a shovel with that on it, actually. Yeah. That'd be good. <laughs> And each of these layers is exploitable, mm. which is our particular Indeed. point of interest. Indeed. So we'll start with the physical layer, which, which from a computer science perspective, must always count from zero, not from one. <laughs> this is why I don't like ground floors being the first floor in, in this country, and also in my country, also the new world. In proper, in proper countries, it's um, <laughs> the ground floor is zero. Um, the physical layer. This is the physical layer, Ethernet cables, you know, but, uh, this, this switches and, and routers and air. And even air now. Yeah. Air. Wireless domain. Yes. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's, a, there's a data center with all the air conditioning units over here. Yep, that look like animals it's drinking from it. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, they're causing it now. Uh, data space book. Yeah. Yeah. 
sucking in a huge amount of water from surrounding areas. The dehydration effect of, of data centers on, on, the, on the surrounding environment is now very, very tangible. And I'm, I'm missing cubic kilometers of, of CO2. Mm, indeed, yeah. Um, and this was, this was probably the, the, the first sort of clandestine, at least in the energetic sense, um, of its kind back in the day. This is a, a, a literally a telephone switching, if, if you might, not even switching, but routing um, structure over the, over the top of Stockholm in the late 1800s. So this, this, this actually, one could even trace a line, one of these hairs, from, from one exchange through it and onto another, and then on from there onto a home, an actual home, you know. How comparable that is uh, with the gramophone that we saw before. Indeed. Know, network, sort of, at your fingertips. Mm, you, can, it, you can sense, you can see, probably, you can know, see mm. how, how it works, because when, when, when the cable is actually live, it might stretch, you know, under its own, under its own weight, and the, and the power that, that passes through it, and sort of, if it warms it up, extends the length, yeah. it starts to yeah. bend more. Just like coming out of the shower. Right. But this is, um, yeah, this is very much public infrastructure, you know, um, manifest. Um, it's a bit sort of blown out for some reason on the projector, but um, but this is the very famous submarine cable map that we've also been, when we first came across it, we were pretty excited. It's not, not yeah. an art project, I'm sure many of you are familiar with it, it's come up a lot in talks um, in recent years. Um, a submarine cable infrastructure that is part of the physical layer that connects whole countries together. And this is almost an entirely monopolized um, uh, space. Uh, Telefonica, the Spanish um, um, uh, uh, telco, is, is, is really dominates the um, submarine cable network these days, I mean, along with others. Um, when Dania and I were in, in Lima teaching a network shop in the, in the west coast of the... Just okay. right there, exactly. Um, we were teaching um, we were teaching a network shop, um, a five day intensive uh, to people there, and uh, and we we showed them that um, their most cherished activist voice blogger was um, was actually not only hosted in California, but the domain name which ended in .pe was actually registered in the states, and we traced the packets um, leading to that actual that actual storage media that was hosting that actual um, actual website. And um, and the, the packets traversed from the west coast of the South, the South American uh, continent over to the to the east, exited out of Brazil, and went all the way up to up through Madrid, through the the home of the conquistadors, you know, um, and then bounced over to the east coast of the United States. So effectively, that even though they were politically and culturally and economically sovereign, infrastructurally, they were not. The the, the, the conquistadors, if you like, still had a a, a very big foot in. Um, in, in, their, in their reality, and they were really angry about it. Um, they were, they, they were, they were, they just burst into internal conversation. I mean, I understand a bit of Spanish, speak a little bit, and and it was a, there was some words there I'd never heard before. But um, no, they were they felt they like they were colonized again. Indeed, yeah. And and the only way they could read that was was by taking a, a, a command line intensive networking workshop, tracing packets, and learning about how to how to get underneath the skin, the proverbial hood, you know. Underneath the interface and actually see what, mm. what processes there are that mm. participate in network exchange. And through that, that's yeah. how you trace many things. That's how you debug your software in a very similar way you trace mm. and debug uh, networking exchange. Or else you're just a defaulted to user. I mean, I, I like um, Elias' take on that. The user needs to be uh, um, reconfigured as it's very much mm. a, a creator, even an antagonist. Yeah. You know, yeah. I like this. Um, this reposition. The user is not about consumption, the user mm. is about exploiting and using the system to its fullest. Mm. Beyond endpoints, yeah. mm. beyond merely riding the bike. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. Some of you might know this. Do you know this? Uh, it's called American Progress. Uh, <laughs> an image by an American painter uh, depicting. Uh, well, depicting parts of uh, the history of this country and uh, people from the old world sailed to the east coast and started well, colonizing effectively, right? Colonizing the continent and the nice, nice, interesting, nice element <laughs> of this image is on your left where you can see the train and the first telegraph, telegraph poles and a wire and back in the day, telegraph poles and electric poles, poles carrying electric cables, were always along the uh, 
railway because it was easier to maintain and you didn't need to cut the force twice and also you could just pull it along. And this is from 18th century paintings. And you can see that already at that time the establishment of a network such as telegraph and railway was one of the top priorities. You know, yeah, of course people in caravans all was very interesting, but industrial revolution and industrial progress has required communication as well as control, and that's one of the implications that network has, a uh, transport network or information network. That control came together uh, with this uh, fairly uh, destiny manifest, I think it's called, right, from American history. Um, and to me, it's just such a such a um, influential image, you know, how how new world, how the world in which we live these days, how it required control from its very beginning. I find it quite uh, important to to sort of to to roll, scroll back through history and actually observe that fact. Mm -hmm. What happens today didn't just start happening. Snowden didn't just pop out from nowhere, you know. All of this has been happening for centuries, and now it just culminated in in being so ubiquitous and nearly tangible. Mm. Yeah, the carrier medium, yeah. almost, you know, chasing away the natives here too. Mm -hmm. Physical layer. Yeah. Zero physical layer is a spirit. Spiritus. Yep. And That's another yeah. example. Yeah. yeah, we kind of prepared, prepared our slides a little bit for the context. You can probably, well, you obviously recognize the outlines of your country and first, first, uh, first one, one of the first ones, uh, first global networks, ARPANET, uh, originally created in, in the 60s, sponsored by militaries, obviously. And you can see here quite clearly that it is a network that connects uh, a subset of smaller networks, smaller networks. Uh, run by universities in different cities and different states suddenly got connected through these really long continental links and organized into into a grid into or rather a, a rhizomatic type of structure star like sort of growing outwards uh, type of structure and very quickly covered uh, the entire continent another interesting example which would be the next slide is a structure developed around the same time uh, in the same country for the same effort of providing uh, communication across the continent and as well control over the territory that network covers. That's the interstate network, the roads that connect your cities and connect the states. Interestingly organized in a grid-like structure, meaning that it's redundant should any of the links, let's say the roads, uh, get broken, you can still get to most of the places just by going around or changing your route, what's what we call it in networking, uh, changing your route maybe to, to be a longer one, but still you would reach your destination should should uh, rapid city road get all fucked up, you can still go around and sort of come to it uh, from the north. You know? mm. So interestingly, uh, control arrives uh, together with the network and surveillance as a part of uh, control, obviously. <laughs> Interesting how all the slides are concentrated around me and my work, but uh, that this work has been done, well, yeah, six years ago. Uh, and it concerned exactly this, this fact, how to break out from a network, how to become netless, how not to have uh, internet connection at all times, although in 2009 it wasn't, well, it was a hot topic, but not, not, not as hot as it is now. And the idea was to create a device that would broadcast the data at all times, and given a huge number of such devices that broadcast and receive this uh, data, uh, citizens could run, independent citizen run, citizen based network just by having those devices and living in the city and moving as they as we usually do and by having to come close uh, come in the vicinity of each other they would swap the data that their devices would carry mm -hmm. yeah 
because cities and city transportation networks are organized in a very similar fashion to computer networks. They have a center and then they have these arms branching out to the sides, connecting periphery uh, regions, yeah, periphery regions to each other via a center, a center where information exchange happens. But the center happens to be in the position of complete control and observation of what happens in the network. And that's how computer networks are built. So in fact, uh, to avoid this type of uh, architecture or what we call a uh, topology, this centralized topology, a network, uh, a mesh network can be used where citizens would not necessarily follow uh, the same routes, the same same path, and move more in a chaotic fashion and exchange, and exchange data without being traced, without the ability of being traced and without having to leave any uh, traces and not having any addresses because there wouldn't be any necessity in that. And that would be a, a parasitic type of network that, would, uh, that, that wouldn't require an infrastructure and would sit on top of an existing one. Yeah, it looked like this. I tried implementing it once, twice actually in, Lo in London and nearly got arrested because people really didn't like the look of these devices. And there were several LEDs blinking uh, on transmit and receive and uh, bus drivers. I wanted to attach the, these two buses to the London bus network. Uh, they, they really... Uh, they didn't like it. <laughs> no way. <laughs> uh, and that's, yeah, that's, that's a concept image. Could look, it could look like that. <laughs> so, and then and now in the um, within that oversized stack, that that pyramid we saw before, the, the, the strata, um, we move up to the data link layer. And the data link layer um, would take the form, um, at least in a common wireless networking context, of um, of of the, of the moment that one's MAC address, one's hardware address to one's device is, is pushed out into the air and it's recognized by another and one, is, one, one says that a link is created and probably the best project, at least I, I certainly think in the critical engineering frame in 2012 was certainly this work by our studio partners Packet Brooker, um, work Packet Brooker by Gordon Savicic and uh, Bank Seolan um, and it's really explored the, um, uh, the, 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 the challenge to, how much time left? Oh god, we're going to rush through it. Okay, um, hardware address. Um, hardware address um, is, you can think of it as like a fingerprint or a license plate in the vehicle. Um, and uh, these are shipped out by one's, um, pushed out by one's vendor um, uh, the, the purpose of actually, um, uh, for the purpose of, of, of uniquely identifying that device on a network such that it can be addressed in the network layer. It, uh, just to look at a very so here you can see, for instance, here are the different BSSIDs in our environment. These are individual access points. But if I then um, go right down to something like, whoops, small. I'll just do the open networks for goodness sakes. And down here we'll start to see people's actual stations. These are iPhones and, and Samsung Galaxy tabs and bits and pieces that are sitting, Good that are actually using those in the, in the room. Whose network is Arker, Ackerman? Ackerman. <laughs> But you'll just see probe requests for people's um, networks they've connected to in the past, hotels they've visited in the past, et cetera, et cetera. And, and these, one can sit outside a person's house and know whether they're home um, just, just by searching for these, these, these MAC addresses. And these MAC addresses um, are also used uh, very, very heavily in order to, to, uh, to improve your location services when you're, when you're navigating. And it's it's it has juridical power as well. It does indeed. They're used in, as forensic evidence in a court of law. And um, the, probably the quote from the Critical Engineering Manifesto that most uh, acutely relates to this is, um, is that the Critical Engineer recognised that each work of engineering engineers its user, um, proportional to that user's dependency upon it. But the more one depends on a given work of technology, you know, one could say that the, the arm is shaped by the hammer, you know, for instance, the, you know, the, ha the hammer shapes the arm. Um, exploring uh, this further, um, uh, we're at, at increasingly at, at dependence on navigating with the device, um, uh, provides a surface for very tangible exploit. And this is something that um, is explored by um, Bengt and, uh, and, and Gordo in this project. These two companies uh, have worked uh, very, very hard to capture um, uh, your movement as, as you as go around the city. 
a couple of researchers showed how it was possible to plug an iPhone, I think four, uh, into a laptop and just suck off a, 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 an SQL uh, file, a flat file system and then show exactly where that person had been every second of the day that their phone had been on for up to a year. Um, and no one was communicated, um, no one was told about that. Uh, Apple was challenged on it, um, didn't say anything typical of Apple really. Google came in and said, Apple, how do you? That's disgraceful. Yeah. And then Google was caught doing the same thing on the Android operating system. Um, and so um, what, what they did was they had a, a if you like, a, a tree of antennas, of radios that are sitting um, in, um, in, in our studio. And then for a big exhibition, uh, we had about 2,000 people coming to the opening in the House of Culture and Develop, the House of World Cultures in, um, in Berlin. And, uh, and they had the equivalent sister tree uh, there. And each one of these radios represents a channel on the, on the wireless 2.4 to 2.5 gigahertz uh, spectrum, wireless Wi-Fi. And they captured all the packets there and then sent them over an encrypted tunnel and, and launched them back into the air in the, in the museum. What that meant was that people um, that were from abroad, that were looking for places to eat and hotels to go to and cafes and bits and pieces, as sun's going down in the, in, in the most sort of desolate part of Berlin, Tiergarten, next to the Bundestag, um, they were out into the, out into the street um, looking for cafes and restaurants and bars that weren't actually in Tiergarten in this, in this, around this major museum. They were walking out into the sort of dreary forested area probably only known to to, to, to junkies and the odd politician trying to get some, some marijuana or something, I don't know. But, um, but, um, but yeah, there's just there's nothing there. And it's sort of people wandering out saying, no, I, I swear it's here, just follow me, follow me. You know, the glow of the, the phone on their face. In fact, they were seeing cafes and, and, um, and restaurants and bars that weren't in Tear Garden, they were next to our studio. But nonetheless, people led by that, by that ontological dependency carried them out into, among the sticks, you know, it was just quite, quite incredible. And they've shown that, they've, they've done this sort of geographic folding a little bit, like one would expect from the situationists or something, um, from Sao Paulo to South Korea, and the Seoul in South Korea, and they've done it in, in uh, you know, they've, they've, they've literally folded the, the map in, in multiple different cities, and it's, it's a lovely, um, lovely work, very powerful. It's yet another example of uh, how our perception is being replaced by how physical perception is being replaced by the uh, technological uh, perception of the world, let's say. Indeed, we, yeah. we, don't, we don't trust our own uh, mm -hmm. abilities of uh, geographic orientation. We just look at the screen yeah. you know, and we prefer that because we, we just prefer it. For some the reason. uniformity of it, the, the, the fact that it's, it's consensually um, it's consensually granted with the authority to, to convey. You know, and it glows. And it glows. <laughs> Good point, Daniel. Um, the network layer. Um, moving up the stack here, the network layer. This is this is where uh, addresses are actually attached to these 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 fingerprints, these MAC addresses, hardware addresses. They don't necessarily have to um, have to have to, to 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 you know they don't reflect anything particularly unique in themselves. Um, in fact, they're quite transient. Um, so the, the MAC address layer is more is more rigid um, and, and persistent, and the, I, one, the network layer is is shifting. Um, and here is a project I'll quickly talk about, um, one of mine, the Transparency Grenade, which I did for the same exhibition of our studio work. We had about 10 pieces in that, in that show in 2012. And um, uh, it, it sought to address the, the, the problem of an increasing lack of transparency in the corporate and governmental um, sector. Um, things of an, of an environmental um, um, nature having clandestine effects on waterways and, 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 and deforestations um, in, uh, in, in, in places like Ecuador at the time were very much on my mind. In my own country of New Zealand, it was something of a, uh, a bit of a heartbreak for me to see certain things pushed through, um, pushed into, in, in, into you know, policies pushed out and bad ones pushed in and decisions made to, um, to, to eat away at national parks, etc., etc., um, without any public consent. And, um, and so uh, I wanted to come up with a, a InstaLeak, um, pull a pin to leak device. Um, I wanted to also explore some of the felt anxiety about information getting out, um, a, a data bomb, one, 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 someone else called it. And so I, um, I took the form of a Soviet uh, F1 hand grenade, a very violent uh, weapon, in other words, a very successful weapon, and, uh, and put a tiny um, ARM-based computer running, a, running Debian uh, Linux on site it. It has a, um, a, a wide band um, wireless antenna and a little microphone and you pull the pin and 
here are the parts laid out. One pulls the pin, that's me being stopped at the airport. There's bomb squad there, put the grenade there, like a bomb squad picking up the grenade and saying, this may be a bomb, let's find out, shall we? You know, and it's like that. So, whatever happened to the German thoroughness? I don't know. It just wasn't there. Um, and uh, yeah, a point of detonation um, is uh, appearing on the map, and then you see the, um, oh, I'm missing a slide there, but then you see the data as someone is browsing on their laptop or, or iPhone or whatever, you see the images that they're browsing, the um, emails that they're sending out, if it's done on the clear uh, websites they visited, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and the, this is all done over encrypted tunnel directly to uh, my server. All right, topologies. Uh, importantly, network topologies describe power relationships. Um, you can see here these power relationships described. This is the typical network, a star network. Center, the router in the center. If you recall, network of the internet or network of uh, ARPANET, uh, yep. you could see those uh, star like networks connected between each other. That's what the internet mm. is network of networks. Indeed. Um, to move data between this node of a, of a ring network to this one, both of these two nodes must trust these other two, mm. you know, for instance. Here's another representation of a, of a compound star network. It's a university network uh, rented using the KAIDA um, LORA system. Quite some years ago, yeah. and these are all like a tree of stars. One could think of it as that. It's actually a really high, super high resolution image. Uh, mm. If you find it online, you can just zoom in and zoom in and zoom in. Mm. It's, cool. it's a great desktop background if you're feeling yeah. in the mood. Well, one of these little points at the end here would be someone's phone or laptop, for instance. Mm. Here's another representation. So, um, God wanted us to have this slide in there, and actually it was already in there, but um, yeah, engineering. Um, from a critical engineering perspective, it's about shifting away from, from, from this definition of engineering to something that's, that's a little bit more, um, uh, um, one, one would obviously reach for the word critical here, but, um, but, but shifting away from engineering or just disenfranchising it from, a, from being a practical application to science or commerce or industry, or sorry, of science to commerce industry, detaching it from that, decoupling it such that it can actually have a freedom to, to be critically engaged as a as a as as, as, a, as a richly um, influential Orphans. language yeah. um, or set of disciplines and languages. Because in fact, these days uh, engineering is sort of enslaved by uh, commerce and by its monetary uh, in feedback, let's say. And no engineer is free like that. No industrial engineer is free mm. to do or to develop something that would just come to his or her head mm. out of the blue end. Julia and I and our colleagues at the studio back in Berlin find it really a uh, huge limitation and actually uh, a negative effect Indeed, that yeah. techno uh, technology and engineering like that can have. Yeah, engineering also is too important to be left to the experts. Mm -hmm. So we need more people to feel comfortable engaging these, these disciplines. So that's, why, that's why clashing engineering with arts kind of has uh, mm -hmm. really fruitful and interesting results. results. Significant technological mm -hmm. And you just start messing you know, without, without fear. Indeed, yeah. Uh, so yeah, toward technopolitical subjectivity, but we've got very little time left, so we need to show a couple of um, projects, critical engineering, um, uh, just to introduce it in a power introduction, and then we'll jump to maybe news tweak and then, yep. 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 Um, Critical engineering is a frame for applied research and development that positions engineering rather than art or design as primary within the creative and critical process. Um, and that's really important to us. Um, art, art has plenty, and art and design have plenty of foreground. Um, engineering um, engaged as such has very little and uh, there is a need for this. We've, we've built the critical engineering, we wrote the critical engineering manifesto and then within no time it was translated into 14 languages and is, is used in, in curricula all around the world and see the, you know, the big posters and hack labs and bits and pieces. We, we never thought it would take off but we clearly um, it clicks like a nerve. And engineering is a, uh, engineering is a term that we apply not only to technological matters mm. but to uh, anything that one would wonder and think about because essentially uh, engineering as uh, a word coming from Greek means uh, an engineer, someone, someone who has bright thoughts. Mm. So as long as you have bright thoughts, whatever, uh, whatever domain those thoughts would uh, belong to, mm. you can engineer that subject to your own liking. Indeed. The critical engineering seeks to answer questions surrounding influence and control in a world of integrated systems and closed opaque technology 
and you can read our manifesto online, we don't need to read it here for you. Um, we will jump past this, and, um, and this, unfortunately, and we'll talk about just this, Trust in Engineering, and the, the project Newstweek, which, um, which yeah, was lucky enough to win the, the Mika and Ars Electronica. Um, we've since shown it uh, all over the world. We're showing it right now in Rotterdam, as part of the, yeah. in the International Film Festival of Rotterdam, um, as part of their interest in propagandism as a, as a cultural practice. Um, and that's the top of the stack um, there. We added our own belief, the ontological layer, we call it. Um, and, um, you know, the eye of... Sauron. <laughs> it's important to say Sauron just doesn't get enough, enough you know, exposure these days. New Zealand this is really important to me. Um, um, people keep talking about NSA and GCHQ and not about yes. Sauron or something. You know. Wake up, world. Um, so, so um, yeah, news tweak. Um, Newstweak uh, started before there were um, wall warts or r routers in a, in a, in a plug. Um, we had the idea of, of putting it together real quick, just simply um, as a test. Um, we, we we built one, plugged it in the wall of the um, the, the, the world's most clandestine um, hacker convention, uh, which is uh, the Chaos Computer Congress. I see great great comparison right there on the wall. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We just stuck it in the wall, and uh, and then we were surveilling the, the local environment, just doing a packet capture and trying to extract host names and bits and pieces, and and, uh, and and we expected it to be discovered in about half an hour, but instead it was up there for the entire congress. No one noticed that the little boring beige bottle is actually a black box that we even super glued into the wall socket because we wanted to make it hard for people to pull out. But um, but no, no one suspected no it at all. Yeah, and then that universal computer, so to say, with uh, several Wi-Fi uh, wi adapters and Wi-Fi scanners was sitting there for four days at Hackers Convention. Yeah. Unnoticed, yeah. unsuspected, and we we, we realised that we were onto something. That um, that you know, if it looks like it's a part of the infrastructure, it will go unnoticed and therefore un, un, unchallenged. Um, and uh, and it relates to that that uh, item in the critical engineering manifesto. The critical engineer seeks uh, well, deconstructs and incites suspicion of rich user experiences. And uh, there it is, Newsweek, uh, fixing the facts. Newsweek, we're not so happy with it, um, but they didn't. We didn't get a cease and desist, so it was okay. Um, um, that's, that's, our, our that's our Indian model there. <laughs> <laughs> He's always at the ready for always hiding. Yeah, yes. Behind every mind is a network. Oh, no. And it's that's a difficult. Yeah, it's a difficult object for um, you know to sort of celebrate because I mean it is possibly <laughs> the most dreary object one's one has seen in a while. Purposely, of course. Yeah, apart from the, maybe a washing machine, but mm. uh, there it is. Um, we'll just go to movie. Yes, just jump yeah. in the movie. Yeah. Yeah. Let's do that. It's not that people think they're being subject to propaganda. If people don't think that, they aren't looking for that, they're much easier to propagandize. And that's the genius of our media system. <laughs> Media is the nervous system of a democracy. If it's not functioning well, the democracy can't function. Thank <laughs> you.